My name is Joel Bainan. I'm Director of Middle East Studies and Professor of History at the American University in Cairo and Professor of Middle East History at Stanford University on leave. I've been engaged in the Middle East since I was 16 years old. I first went to Israel for six months as a member of a group of uh, young people trained to be leaders in a Zionist youth movement. We spent six months on a kibbutz. Um, I had, at that point, 12 years of Hebrew school, so uh, I began to study Arabic since the kibbutz movement that we were affiliated with was a moderate Zionist organization and believed in Arab-Jewish coexistence, so they didn't have any problem with uh, teaching me Arabic. My first Arabic teacher was uh, an Iraqi Jew who had uh, left Iraq when most of the Jews were forced out of Iraq in 1950-51. Um, came to this kibbutz as a member of a youth aliyah group and was the only member of the group who stayed on at the kibbutz, taught Arabic in the kibbutz high school, um, was very well known, very beloved, passed away not too long ago. Um, and I've been studying Arabic and engaged in the Arab-Israeli conflict ever since. Let's start then with the, the reinvigoration of the so-called peace process. Uh, the Bush administration, uh, after starting, it seems, uh, paying very little attention to this conflict, it, taking what's been reported as a hands-off approach to this conflict, uh, is now um, apparently trying to put more energy into restarting negotiations for some kind of final peace settlement. How would you describe those processes, and should we take them seriously? Fundamentally, this is a charade. Um, I think that's the most basic thing that we need to understand about it. Um, we are heading into an election year. The Bush administration is ideologically committed to full force support of Israel more than any American administration since World War II has been. Um, the Bush administration is certainly not going to do anything that looks like or can be interpreted as pressure on Israel going into an election year. Uh, they're already likely to lose uh, big in the Congress and probably the presidency as well. They need to uh, stop the damage rather than create reason for more damage. Uh, so I think what is happening here is largely an effort to make it look like the administration's Middle East policy is not a total catastrophe, which it is. Uh, Afghanistan does not look very well, good these days. Iraq, of course, is uh, the biggest foreign policy debacle of the 20th century, if not longer. And uh, I think one could make a similar argument that the hands-off uh, approach to uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict since the Bush administration came into office basically unleashed Ariel Sharon on the Palestinians and has resulted in a ratcheting up of what was already uh, pretty intense uh, pressure on the Palestinian people in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Um, at this point, living standards uh, in both territories, but especially in the Gaza Strip, were absolutely horrendous. Uh, so what the talks are primarily about now are marginal palliative issues. How many roadblocks may be removed? Will the Israelis release the tax monies that they purportedly collect on behalf of the Palestinians but have frozen since uh, the Hamas government came into office? How many of the perhaps 10,000 political prisoners that Israel uh, has will be released? Will Israel stop its campaign of targeted assassinations? Uh, the talks that are scheduled don't deal directly with the questions that have to be settled if there's going to be uh, any permanent, stable resolution to the conflict. What are going to be the borders of a Palestinian state? What are exactly going to be the terms of sovereignty of such a state? Will it control its borders with Jordan and Egypt? 
uh, what will be the fate of the settlers and the settlements, how many of them are going to remain and what territory is or isn't going to be annexed to Israel, water rights, Jerusalem, the rights of refugees, which of course is a huge hot button issue for both sides. Um, what the Bush administration hopes, insofar as it has any realistic hope at all, is that it can pressure uh, Abu Mazen, Palestinian president, who at this point isn't particularly popular in his own community, just as Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert is not particularly popular in Israel. Uh, Bush administration hopes to pressure Abu Mazen into accepting what was called in the pretty much defunct roadmap uh, a Palestinian state with provisional borders. This is a nightmare because what that will mean is that uh, Israel will effectively annex whatever it wants to annex, probably somewhere around 10 to 15 percent of the West Bank, plus uh, exerting control over the Jordan River Valley, uh, which would leave you with three or four uh, isolated cantons inside the West Bank, enough territory so that it might look like a state, but broken up enough by Israeli settlements, settlement roads, the separation barrier, and so on, so that there would be no effective sovereignty of any sort. Um, the Palestinians know that this is what Israel and the United States would like them to accept. Uh, they don't want to accept it, uh, but Abu Mazen and his close associates, people like uh, Nabil Shah, Saab Erekat, um, they may at some point come to feel that we have no choice but to agree to this because there is nothing better on offer, and there is nothing better on offer, and there is very little likelihood into the foreseeable future, uh, even assuming that a democratic Congress and a democratic uh, president uh, after 2008, that the Palestinians will get anything that looks more like a sovereign state than that. Well, if that's the case, and even if Abu Mazen and the current Palestinian Authority government choose to accept some uh, form of this attenuated uh, Palestinian state, what are the prospects that they would succeed in carrying along the rest of the Palestinian communities? Um, I speak, of course, of the other political aggregations, Hamas, um, Islamic Jihad, uh, and, and the others, uh, but uh, more broadly speaking, the Palestinian people in the West Bank and Gaza. I, I don't think such a solution could win the support of a very large number of people, certainly not of Hamas and Islamic Jihad, but um, also the broad center of Palestinian public opinion, which amazingly still supports two states' solution, Palestinian state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, uh, with minor border adjustments and the capital in East Jerusalem. I mean, that is still the majority position. Um, and it's actually, in a certain format, a majority position among Israeli Jews as well. Um, or at least among Israeli citizens, if you count the 20% of them or so who are Palestinian Arabs. So what, if such a thing is instituted, and I am very skeptical about whether it would happen. This is what I think the Bush, this is the best case that the Bush administration is hoping for, I think, but I don't think it's likely to happen. But if it were to happen, it would be sold on the grounds that uh, the Palestinian people have simply been uh, ground into the earth. They have almost no economic means uh, left whatsoever, and that this is necessary uh, in order to uh, get let people uh, revive economically, allow people to remain on the land, um, and so on. Um, even with those arguments, my guess is that this is, would not be a popular solution among Palestinians, and it will certainly not be uh, a long-term solution. Uh, all the more so because on the Israeli side, 
there are going to be elections soon, and at this moment, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is the leading candidate uh, to become prime minister, and uh, he is not going to be the one to preside over the establishment of a meaningful Palestinian state. Well, that raises the question that has been raised far more often in recent years than I think uh, for a long time prior to that, and that is uh, the question that's raised by people like Jeff Halper uh, from a very, um, I would say, pessimistic viewpoint coming to the conclusion that the Israeli policies have made a two-state solution impossible and that what uh, the only prospect that uh, lies ahead is some form of a one-state solution. As he says, a transition from a, uh, a national liberation struggle to an anti-apartheid struggle for a democratic secular state um, that would cover all of Palestine. There's a lot of merit in that argument. It's not actually a very new argument. Um, Post-1967, it first began to be raised uh, in a forceful way by uh, former deputy uh, mayor of Jerusalem, Meron Ben Venisti, who was the head of the West Bank database project and documenting the expansion of the settlements and basically saying two states. Um, there is also, within the Zionist tradition, uh, a current which embraced a binational state. Um, when I spoke earlier about the kibbutz I was on uh, as a teenager, that's where they came from and that's why the idea of studying Arabic and so on was acceptable to them. Uh, so that idea has been around for a while and uh, was not considered um, wildly off the political map on the Zionist side uh, anyway, uh, except between 1949 and the more recent years. On the other hand, difficult as it is to imagine establishing two sovereign states at this point, it's even more difficult to imagine establishing one sovereign state because whereas you could argue that there is a majority of Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and sort of a majority of Israeli citizens who would embrace a two-state solution of some sort, there is no such majority of either side for a one-state solution. Both sides want to have their national states. Now, I personally don't give a hoot about national states. I'm not a big fan of the Zionist national state. And the only reason why I've ever been a supporter of having a Palestinian national state is because Palestinians should have the same right to self-determination as any other people. And if that's the form they'd like it to take, it's their right. So, okay, I'm in favor of it. Then. Um, I would rather look at the matter slightly differently, especially because I'm not an Israeli, I'm not a Palestinian, I don't have political rights in that part of the world. I don't think it's my role to be dispensing political advice about you should have this many or that many states. Uh, and anyway, um, as an American citizen, um, my political energies need to be directed towards changing the policies of my government, um, which has been for uh, many, many years aiding and abetting the occupation, uh, undermining Palestinian human rights, civil rights, uh, national rights, um, vetoing every reasonable resolution at the United Nations concerning this issue, uh, undermining all sorts of efforts to establish peace, uh, egging Israel on to attack Lebanon uh, last summer, uh, blocking Israeli-Syrian negotiations when it's quite clear that an Israeli-Syrian settlement is in, within reach. So those are the kinds of things that I personally think I have a right and even a duty to speak out about. But if we turn to the question of states and so on, I'd reframe it this way. Many people, and certainly the great majority of Israelis, who think about two states, think about it in the way that uh, former Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin uh, did. And 
the terms that he used were us here, them there. And former Prime Minister Ehud Barak used the same terminology. The thought behind that was we don't acknowledge that Palestinians have the right to establish a state. We don't acknowledge that this territory is uh, in some sense the legitimate homeland of the Palestinian people. Um, only Jews, in our view, that is Robin Barak, the majority of the Israeli people, uh, have real historic national rights to this place. But we have this problem, and the only way to get rid of this problem is to establish this Palestinian state, and they will be over there, and they'll be out of our hair, and that's the end of it. Well, this was always a totally unrealistic solution. Uh, first, the economies are very heavily intertwined. Uh, second, if the settlements or any significant numbers of the settlements remain inside the West Bank, um, Israel will have a very important foothold in the territories. Uh, Palestinians need to be able to work in some kind of uh, situation in which there's going to be Israeli capital, Israeli management, Israeli technology, and so on. Not because there isn't any uh, Palestinian capital or technology or managerial capacity, it's just that um, the two communities are so widely disparate at, at this point, and the single biggest thing that the Palestinian people need simply at the level of uh, assuring their livelihood is work. Um, so, and there is no real way for Israelis to say, okay, we actually have nothing to do with Hebron or East Jerusalem and so on. And similarly, there's no way for Palestinians to say, well, Jaffa was never part of Palestine, Haifa was never part of Palestine, these four or five hundred villages that were destroyed in the course of the 1948 war, that's not part of Palestine. So it's artificial. So in the long run, no matter how many states there are going to be, none, one, or two, the two peoples are going to have to live together. And any solution that envisions separation as the guiding principle, rather than living together as a guiding principle, I don't think is going to work and doesn't make me feel uh, very satisfied. Um, it may be that uh, one state is completely unpractical um, at this moment, um, and it may be that um, constitutionally there may never be a unitary state because of the long history of conflict, or at least not for a very long time into the future. Um, but it's possible if people were creative and had goodwill, which is not the case now, uh, that you could establish some Canton system something like Belgium or Switzerland or something like that that would allow uh, both national communities to see the entire country as their homeland um, and at the same time preserve uh, critical national cultural rights in particular territories where there were concentrations of one or another of the groups. Now, whenever that's raised, of course, people say, well, this is the Middle East, it's not Belgium, it's not Switzerland, it's a different, well, and that's true, which is why this isn't happening uh, tomorrow or next year and maybe not in uh, my lifetime. Uh, but some variant of that kind of a solution, I think, uh, would meet the need for both sides to have a state. Uh, and so there may, in fact, be some stage of establishing two states on the way to such a thing. Uh, and it would acknowledge that, like it or not, there are two peoples with historical connections to this part of the world. Uh, it's true that the Zionist movement was 
enabled by its alliance with imperialism, that it's a settler colonial movement, so forth and so on, but settler colonial movements, uh, unjust as this may be, sometimes succeed, and um, the descendants of the founders then have a real connection to the place. I mean, would be somewhat ridiculous, for example, to say that all white Americans need to leave because their ancestors came and massacred the Native Americans and stole the Southwest from uh, Mexico. And uh, so, I mean, they did, it's true, but uh, it's not realistic at this point to uh, dismantle the country because it was established on the basis of historic crimes because all countries are established on the basis of historic crimes and we could look at uh, any of the Arab states or any of the European states and get into their history and uh, it wouldn't be as uh, uh, pristine as people would like to present it. So there's an ugly history of struggle and it's going to be a big project to overcome it. What are from this conversation and not just this conversation, the prospects of, uh, in our lifetime, seeing some kind of uh, movement towards a resolution of this conflict, the prospects look pretty dim right now. What do you see as the key obstacles, the key barriers to making progress? You've mentioned the role of the United States. Let's talk a little bit about um, the policies that have been obstacles to movements towards a peaceful resolution, and then also um, uh, why those obstacles exist, why the U.S. policy is what it is. Well, I agree with your sub suggestion that U.S. policy is the single biggest uh, obstacle to a peaceful resolution of the conflict, and it has been so at least since the late 60s, um, it's worth remembering actually that it was France that enabled Israel to become uh, a regional superpower, supplied it with nuclear technology, with aircraft, with tanks in the 1950s, all negotiated by the uh, recently elected president of Israel, Shimon Peres, in his capacity as director general of the Ministry of Defense in the 1950s. Uh, so since the French got out of the game with the 1967 war, it's been the Americans who have been, first of all, Israel's principal military supplier. Uh, the United States did give some military support to Israel before 1967. Hawk missiles were sold in 1962. Uh, but uh, offensive aircraft and major weapons systems of an offensive nature uh, were not supplied until after 1967. Uh, and it's important to note that because the United States basically in 1967 reaffirmed what the CIA and the armed forces believed in 1948, which was Israel is going to be the strongest military power here, and that's why we should recognize Israel in 1948, and that's why we should support Israel post-1967. So in 1969, you had a huge uh, bump up in the level of American military and economic aid to Israel, and that's continued uh, ever since with uh, Israel being the largest single recipient of U.S. foreign aid uh, since that period. And, as we know, uh, the Bush administration, in the midst of this uh, so-called initiative for a peaceful resolution of the conflict, has now proposed to, yet again, increase its military aid to Israel, uh, along with some $20 billion of uh, military sales to Saudi Arabia and uh, the Arab Gulf countries. So. Um, the first obstacle is this very powerful military relationship with Israel. Uh, there is simply no way that supplying arms, and according to the Bush administration's policy, which is likely to be adopted in one form or another to both sides, uh, produces peace. It, in fact, uh, perpetuates conflict. 
uh, and you don't need to be a genius to figure this out. Uh, but um, aside from the geostrategic reasons for this, there's uh, uh, all the American arms manufacturers who are totally gung-ho for another $30 billion worth of business. Uh, you know, why shouldn't they make large profits at the expense of the taxpayer? Because that's essentially what happens when military aid is given. We get taxed to give that money to Boeing and Lockheed and um, all the other arms manufacturers. So there is a very powerful lobby over and above the Jewish Zionist lobby and the Christian Zionist lobby who are gung-ho for this kind of thing. Second uh, element that has to change in American policy is uh, the unilateralism that the Bush administration has uh, raised to an explicit principle that we don't give a hoot about the United Nations, we don't give a hoot about NATO, we don't give a hoot about the European Union, we don't give a hoot about Russia. The United States is the force that calls the shots throughout the Middle East. Well, the Clinton administration, although it uh, embraced multilateralism in many respects, uh, Actually, when it came to Middle East policy, and in particular to the Arab-Israeli conflict, was just as unilateralist as the Bush administration. Um, the Clinton administration established itself as the sole uh, neutral broker, so-called, uh, in the uh, Oslo process. It was no such thing. The Clinton administration was in its day, the most pro-Israel administration until the Bush administration came into office. Um, if you read um, what's been written about by Rob Malley, who was the National Security Council person responsible for managing the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, in the Clinton administration, you know, he published articles in the New York Review of Books and elsewhere um, explaining that the um, Clinton administration was simply not paying attention to the fact that there was this massive settler uh, expansion uh, during the 1990s while the Oslo process was underway. And the Palestinians kept on saying, well, how, how are we going to have negotiations for an independent state when the Israelis are gobbling up the territory with new settlements and the settlements are expanding, the population, and so forth? The Clinton administration just did not pay attention to that uh, until the very, very, very last moment uh, when President Clinton, on his way out of office, got it, began to get his mind wrapped around this issue, but far too little and too late at that point, and he was a political lame duck and could, was unlikely to get his program through at that point. Um, so, uh, American unilateralism has to be challenged, and um, we need to come to an understanding that um, the Middle East is far too important, and there are far too many conflicting interests there for it to be stabilized in a way that accomplishes even a modicum of justice on the basis of American superpower uh, intervention and sorting things out uh, as any given administration would like to see that happen. Um, the third thing that has to happen, uh, and oddly enough, it has happened or begun to happen at the level of discourse in the Bush administration, uh, as opposed to any of the previous American administrations, is there has to be a realization that the discussion is not simply about what concessions Israel will make to the Palestinians, but that the Palestinians are a people with national rights whose historical connection to the territories that we are speaking about is just as valid as the connection that Jews have to the territories. So. It's not the case that one party is the real claimant and the others are simply a nuisance, and that's the way that Israeli and, for the most part, American policy has been conducted. 
uh, I say the Bush administration has uh, begun to change this uh, conception because President Bush did, uh, as the Israelis were dismantling the Janine refugee camp in the spring of 2002, but he did come out and say the policy of the administration is for the, the establishment of two states. Uh, now he didn't go on and lay out the rationale for it in quite the same terms that I'm using here, uh, but at least it is the official policy of the American government that the Palestinians have the right to a state with uh, some form of sovereignty, of course. It's not clear what, what that will actually be in Bush administration terms. So those, I think, are some of the issues that uh, need to be tackled. Now, once you establish those broad principles, then uh, the specific questions that are at issue, the hot button questions, uh, look a little bit differently. So for example, uh, on the matter of the refugees, which may be the hardest uh, matter, at least in principle. Uh, there's lots of international law, UN resolutions, and so on, that would lead to the conclusion that the refugees have the right to go back to their homes if they want to live in peace uh, with the Israelis. And there's no reason at all why that principle should not be affirmed. Affirming that principle does not mean that five million Palestinians are tomorrow or any time soon going to move back inside the borders of the Green Line the 1967 border between Israel and its uh, uh, Arab neighbors. Uh, in fact, a couple of years ago, uh, a survey was taken of uh, refugees inside the West Bank and uh, Lebanon and indicated that no more than 10% actually would even want to come back if there were other viable options. Now, the survey was criticized by the Palestinians because, of course, it undermines what is presumed to be the Palestinian national position, that of course they all want to go back and so forth and so on. Um, but, you know, at this point, um, relatively few people are still alive who have any uh, significant personal direct memory of Palestine. Uh, people certainly do, for the most part, identify as Palestinians, want to preserve that identity. Uh, but actually, there's pretty good argument that going back to live in a Jewish state is going to undermine rather than preserve that identity. And uh, um, so if people could be uh, resettled inside Lebanon or Syria with full political rights, which they don't have in either of those countries, if they could be... Uh, accepted as immigrants in Canada and Australia, which have both said that they would be willing to do such a thing. If Israel and the United States and the Arab countries were to contribute money to uh, a fund for rehabilitation and resettlement and people would be given training to have skilled positions and if they could actually get jobs in places and so on, then it would be reasonable that people would not want to go back. I mean, if you take a Jewish analogy, um, around the turn of the 19th, 20th century, there were over two and a half million Jews that lived in the eastern territories of the Russian Empire in what was called the Pale of Settlement. And uh, the Bund, the Jewish Socialist Organization, took the principle, uh, took the position that uh, that territory is the national home of the Jewish people. Now, they weren't thinking about Middle Eastern Jews and so forth and so on. Uh, but uh, a very large number of those Jews, in fact, left those territories and came first and foremost to the United States, but to other places in Western Europe and North and South America as well, um, because they were being persecuted, pogroms, anti-Semitism, so on. And um, once 
there was a regime change and the Soviet Union was established, hardly anybody said, oh, well, well, let's go now back to our historic homeland. I mean, and it wasn't because even people were so uh, terribly rich. I mean, the Lower East Side in the 1920s was a pretty poor place and most of the Jews who were living there, in fact, come from these areas. Um, so in terms of population movements and histories and so on, what I'm suggesting here um, isn't off the map of human experience. Now, I want to be clear that I'm not proposing that this happen in uh, way one, two, three, four, five. I don't think it's my position to do that. I'm just saying that once you've got certain principles that are acceptable about uh, how this conflict should be viewed and, and, and how the uh, conflict should be resolved, and you begin to apply it to a concrete question like what do we do with the refugees, um, and you don't shove whatever proposal you have reached down the throats of the refugees, but have some kind of consultative democratic discussion with representatives and so on, it's less intractable than uh, people tend to think it is now. I want to explore um, the, the roots of the U.S. foreign policy. You talked about an apparent shift, and I've heard this before from other analysts and historians, that took place after the uh, Six-Day War. And you also talked about something that I think gets uh, far less attention than it deserves, and that is the alliance with the French government prior to that, um, that indeed there was this kind of strategic alliance that Israel had forged with, at that time, a, a different superpower, but still a global uh, colonial power, uh, the French in that case. Um, today, we are hearing, uh, most uh, notably, the Walt Mearsheimer paper uh, in the London uh, Review of Books, I think. Um, it's London. actually coming out as a book in three weeks. Uh, and this is a critical review of U.S. foreign policy, uh, which basically argues, uh, and this is of course a gloss, that the actual interests of the United States have been compromised by this relationship with uh, the State of Israel, and that this, is, this reflects a distortion of U.S. foreign policy caused by um, uh, the, the power of the so-called pro-Israel lobby, APAC being perhaps the most um, uh, visible um, and identifiable representative of this lobby, but including other organizations like the American Jewish Committee and, the, and others. Um, how can we, uh, as you know, citizens of this country and as people who are concerned about bringing about peace in the Middle East, look at this situation and disentangle uh, the influence, which is, we know, is at some level uh, uh, affecting U.S. foreign policy and the behavior of Congress by groups like AIPAC, um, disentangle that influence from this other wellspring of U.S. foreign policy, the strategic interests of the United States, and the place that Israel uh, has in realizing those interests? Well, I think the key to understanding how things work is precisely the word that you used, uh, disentangle. But rather, I would say, the two are intimately intertwined. And because they have become intertwined over the course of many decades, uh, it is very difficult analytically to pull these things apart. And there's a third factor that I would put in there, which is a kind of a cultural factor, um, which would go something like this. After the Holocaust, anti-Semitism became the symbol of evil and backwardness in the world. And so no one who had, who had the view of themselves as an enlightened person, whether they were centerish or leftish or right centerish. I mean, of course, there were neo Nazis and so on, but uh, people in the political mainstream, none of those people wanted to be identified with anti Semitism of any sort whatsoever. 
And to the extent that establishing the state of Israel was considered the West's uh, atonement for having stood by, essentially, while the mass murder of European Jewry happened, to say nothing of 2,000 years of anti-Semitism, um, that all was put in one package. So you didn't want to be anti-Semitic, and being uh, opposed to Israeli policy or to the establishment of the state of Israel was considered to be anti-Semitic. So there was this cultural foundation, um, and that spoke uh, to uh, liberal Protestants, it spoke to evangelical Protestants, and uh, even to uh, European-style uh, secularists. So that's a cultural foundation on which there was this broad global consensus from the Soviet Union to the United States that both established the State of Israel, um, but clearly for geostrategically very different reasons. The Soviet Union was interested in smashing the British Empire. The United States was interested in augmenting its power uh, in the Middle East after World War II. Um, and of course, um, both the Jewish component of the Zionist lobby and the increasingly powerful Christian component of the Zionist lobby continue to push this notion that any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. And of course, you cannot be anti-Semitic because that's a sign of quasi-fascist political sympathies, and that's no good. So OK, there is um, both the actual fact that there is a cultural, uh, let's say, uh, basis on which policy takes place. And then there's the manipulation of that cultural basis by uh, those who are supportive of Israeli policy. Then there is, I would say, uh, built on that cultural openness, a strategic orientation which was already on the table in 1948 when, as I said before, the CIA, the uh, armed services, judged that Israel would likely win the war with the surrounding Arab states who had no significant military capacity to speak of with the uh, exception of Jordan, whose forces were commanded by the British and therefore not going to engage in his, with Israel in a very significant way outside of the Jerusalem area. Um, and so it was on that basis that uh, Truman, with his personal sympathies and with a Democratic Party that depended importantly on Jewish votes in states like New York and Illinois and California, so, well, all the stars are aligned. Why, why would I make any other choice uh, just because I care about the rights of these Palestinian Arabs who no one has ever really heard of and what they're mostly Muslims and we don't know what that is anyway and they're you know viewed as backward medieval we don't know what I mean how how would it be from the point of view of Western history, Western geostrategic thinking, Western culture, that was a foregone conclusion. Um, and the only time that that orientation was shaken up in the United States was the 1956 uh, Suez War, because there Israel colluded with France and uh, Britain to attack Egypt. Um, and there were a number of things that were wrong about this from the point of view of the United States. First, the United States was in favor of dismantling the French and the British empires because uh, Eisenhower administration uh, saw, uh, much to its credit, despite the fact that it was considered to be a, a Republican, conservative, know-nothing kind of administration, but they saw that uh, if the British and French empires remained intact, that was going to create uh, room for the spread of communism. And of course, they have their Cold War containment ideology behind that, but the basic analysis was correct. Uh, so Vietnam, in that sense, was not an accident that the National Liberation Movement in Vietnam was led by the Communist Party. Um, 
And that's exactly what the Eisenhower administration was trying to uh, stop, and therefore it supported uh, France leaving Algeria, it supported uh, France leaving Vietnam, and so forth. So it was completely against the whole conception that Israel would unite with the British and French empires in order to smash uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser's Egypt, who was considered to be an opponent of both, uh, and uh, had the audacity to nationalize the Suez Canal, in which uh, the government of Great Britain was the single largest shareholder, and the corporation was headquartered in Paris. And President Eisenhower basically told uh, the Israelis who had occupied the Sinai Peninsula and the Gaza Strip, got to get out. And Prime Minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, had already proclaimed that we have established the Third Kingdom of Israel. So Israel was committed to remaining in the territories. Well, once the United States said, no, you get now, and the Soviet Union, for its reasons, also said the same, they got out and there was no question about it. So here is a situation in which, uh, despite the cultural affinity the, and so forth, um, there were uh, clear geostrategic reasons for the United States to uh, force Israel to abandon its conquest, and there was absolutely no question that this was going to happen. Uh, and, you know, there was some wailing and moaning among uh, American Zionist groups about this, but it, it, there was not the slightest possibility that they would prevail. Um, you had a similar moment like that uh, many years later towards the end of the first Bush administration when uh, the first Gulf War, or actually the second Gulf War, if you count the Iran-Iraq wars, the first was over in mid-1991. And um, the United States had agreed to give Israel $10 billion in loan guarantees to absorb uh, immigrants from the former Soviet Union. Um, and the Bush administration, as part of the uh, atmospherics for trying to convene the uh, Madrid conference, which did convene eventually in October of 1991 and began the process which eventually resulted in the Oslo agreements and so on. Um, the Bush administration was trying to get Israel to agree not to spend any of this $10 billion in the occupied territories, because they were in fact settling former uh, uh, Soviet Jews or even former Soviet non-Jews who said they were Jews to get out of the Soviet Union in the occupied territories. There are lots of them, for example, in Kiryat Arba, which is um, near Hebron and a, a particularly uh, militantly right-wing uh, settlement. Uh, and uh, at a certain point, the Zionist lobby mounted a lobbying campaign in Congress to try to get Congress to uh, pass legislation prohibiting the Bush administration from restricting the use of the $10 billion in the occupied territories. Uh, President Bush uh, convened a press conference, uh, I think this was towards the end of the summer of 1991, and he said, look, they have sent hundreds of people up to Capitol Hill till I'm only one lonely guy, and boom, as soon as he called them out on this, for whatever reason, he had been convinced that this had to be given to the Arab side in order to make Madrid happen. And as soon as he said the lobby is trying to do something which is against the policy interests of the United States and on the president, it went away and they didn't do it. Um, so those are just two examples of when the president decides that he is going to put the full force of his office behind a decision that so-called supporters of Israel don't like because he thinks that this is a national security issue or an important geostrategic issue, the president gets his way. Now, there's a lot of cowardice in American politics. So there are lots of occasions when presidents or certainly senators or representatives don't do that because, yes, they will pay a price. Uh, President Bush, the first President Bush was not reelected. I don't believe it was because of this. I think it was because the economy was in the toilet. But, um, you know, he, he certainly thought, okay, what's it going to cost me to say this? But he decided that it should be said. 
So the lobby does have power. It can uh, elect or uh, unelect individual congresspersons or senators uh, who they have targeted as insufficiently supportive of Israel's policies. There's a certain track record on them doing it. Um, although, in certain cases, they take credit for more than they actually have been able to do because some of the people that they've uh, been uh, trying to get uh, kicked out of office were likely to lose anyway because they were weak for, for other reasons. Um, but, no, the lobby is real, and it certainly uh, has uh, power not only in Congress, which is very powerful in Congress, to be sure, in the media, um, even in places like uh, the Chicago Council of Foreign Relations, which just this week canceled a talk by Walt and Mearsheimer where they were supposed to promote their book. Um, I've had at least two uh, speaking engagements uh, of mine canceled by pressure from uh, community groups. Uh, and Tony Judd was supposed to speak at the Polish Consulate in uh, New York. So, yeah, this goes on, and there's actually a whole website, uh, muzzlewatch.com, which is devoted to uh, documenting all of this. Uh, but this is already in a diff we're in a different moment now, because 10 or 15 years ago, when they were doing the same sort of thing, they did it quietly, and they more or less got away with it. Now, it's open. I mean, they have to give up a lot when they have to publicly say, we are against tenure for Nadia Abulhaj in uh, Colombia. We are against tenure for Norman Finkelstein in DePaul. We are against Juan Cole being promoted to a professorship at Yale. Um, we are against uh, all these people speaking publicly. I mean, this is anti-democratic. And there, there's all sorts of language that they can use to try to uh, justify their position, and of course they do continue to try to suggest that anybody who criticizes Israel is an anti-Semite, um, even if you're Jewish, so then you're a self-hating Jew if not an anti-Semite. Um, but they are now much more on the defensive, but they start from an extremely strong position. Why? Because there have been only very few cases the two that I cited and maybe a few odd others, where uh, the executive branch has said, no, what Israel wants to do is not uh, in the interest of the United States, and we are going to call them on it. Uh, I guess another one would be the, um, the AWACS aircraft that were sold to Saudi Arabia in the Reagan administration. And they were sold, even though the Israel supporters screamed about it. Uh, so. When the crunch comes, presidents in particular can say, no, this is the strategic interest of the country, the national security interest of the country, however they formulate it, and this is the way it's going to go, and you Israel supporters are going to just have to fall into line. And by and large, they do, except for the lunatic right-wing um, elements. So the fact that they have been challenged so frequent, infrequently gives people the impression, well, of course, Israel's interests are the same as the interests of the United States. That's kind of the default understanding of the Middle East, because Israel is the only democracy in the region, which is certainly not the case, uh, neither that it's a democracy nor that it's the only one, um, and so on. But that's the normal way of, of, of understanding the situation. So um, people who want to untangle this have to do it at two levels. First, an empirical critique of Israeli policies, which that's actually out there in, in, in many places, and not conventional wisdom, but compared to what the situation was, let's say, in 1973, when, when I began my career as a graduate student at Harvard, uh, it's very easy to find information 
that was totally unavailable unless you read Hebrew uh, in those years. Um, and the other level of analysis is where Walt and Mearsheimer really fall short, and that is American imperialism. I mean, that category is unthinkable to them because they are centrist, realist, political scientists who uh, don't imagine that there is anything nefarious about American foreign policy or could be Amer anything nefarious about American foreign policy because we are a democratic country, democratic countries don't start wars, democratic countries don't engage in uh, policies that uh, destabilize areas and so forth and so on. And all you have to do is just a little quick look at American involvement in the Middle East since the 1953 CIA-sponsored coup that brought the Shah of Iran back to power after he had fled the country uh, as a result of uh, the movement to nationalize oil uh, in, the, in the country. So, uh, again, there's lots of information out there to build up the case for what the actual uh, imperial uh, role of the United States has been uh, in the Middle East, but that's, I think, in a way, a much harder nut to crack because if the United States has played an imperial role in the Middle East, well, we certainly have in Latin America as well, and then what about East Asia? And then we have to start raising very big questions about what our foreign policy has been altogether, and it's actually not just a question of foreign policy, it's a question of domestic policy. Uh, President Eisenhower spoke about the military-industrial complex. Um, that's what he was talking about, and uh, his warnings about that structure coming to dominate the country and the price the country would have to pay, uh, not only in terms of uh, an overly aggressive foreign policy but also the domestic cost of that kind of foreign policy and the erosion of civil liberties. Well, the Bush II administration has brought that to us in spades. This is a very difficult thing for Americans to take on, even if Bush and the Republican Party will be defeated in the 2008 elections, which I expect will be the case. Well, we've been talking for about an hour now. Um, is there some way you'd like to wrap up this discussion. Yeah, because what I've been saying and what many people who have been following these matters closely have been saying is extremely depressing. Uh, this is a very big problem. We are nowhere near achieving a uh, long-term stable resolution with any modicum of justice. Um, I would be surprised if that were achieved in my lifetime, although I would be very delighted. So I want to mention something which just happened in the West Bank, which I think is emblematic of how peace can and will be established, although this is just a tiny example. Um, back in early June, I visited the town, town, hamlet of Atuani in the South Hebron Hills. Uh, this is the poorest, most desolate place I have ever been in my life. They have no running water. They're not connected to the national electricity grid. They don't receive uh, regular news. They don't have land telephone lines. And to just embitter their lives even more, there are two uh, settlements overlooking uh, their uh, village, uh, which are totally green, use all the water they want, and um, the settlers attack children from the neighboring villages who are on their way to school in the six-room schoolroom that the residents of Atuani built and which the Israeli army considers illegal because it was built without a permit, so it's on a 10-year uh, suspended a demolition order because they can't have a school, an elementary school in their village. There's 180 people in this village. Um, and there's a team of from the Christian peacekeepers and from Italian Project Dove in the village. So their connection to the internet through their uh, 
mobile telephones is the only way that the village communicates with the outside world on any regular basis. And the village has a website, and you can find out about it. It's www.tuani, T-U-W-A-N-I, uh, dot com, I think, maybe dot org. Um, the village and the surrounding villages have, for the last several years, participated in a summer camp for children. And the summer camp has historically been organized by the South Hebron Committee, which is a project of Ta'ayush. Ta'ayush means coexistence. It's an organization of Palestinian and Jewish citizens of Israel um, who precisely have this vision of living together as opposed to separation. This year, the popular committee of Tuani decided that they are going to organize the summer camp. And not only did they organize the summer camp for their children and the uh, Palestinian children of the surrounding villages, they invited for the last three days of the two-week summer camp Jewish children from the hand-in-hand -hand school in Jerusalem to come and join them. Uh, and I was, uh, just the other day, sent pictures from the summer camp, Arab and Jewish children, very young, uh, 8, 10, 12, playing together, they're sitting on donkeys, they're painting each other's faces, they're listening to stories. It's like normal. So in the absolute worst imaginable circumstances, grinding poverty, physical attacks by settlers, and there's way more than just attacking the children, the settlers poison their sheep and burn their fields, and I mean, this is a real horrific scene, but parents from Jerusalem, not the vast majority of Israeli Jews to be sure, but some group of enlightened parents decided this is the future, our kids have to learn to live together, and you see when they're encouraged to do it, they do, and they can. And that is going to be the future if there is going to be any future. You've been listening to an interview with Professor of Middle East History, Joel Bainan. Joel Bainan is on extended leave from Stanford University, where he taught for over 20 years, starting in 1983. He is currently director of the Middle East Studies Department at the American University in Cairo, Egypt. Joel Bainan is contributing editor of Middle East Report, and his writings have been featured in The Nation magazine and Le Monde Diplomatique. His books include The Struggle for Sovereignty, Palestine and Israel, 1993-2005, to The Dispersion of Egyptian Jewelry, Culture, Politics, and the Formation of a Modern Diaspora, and Was the Red Flag Flying There? Marxist Politics and the Arab-Israeli Conflict in Egypt and Israel, 1948 to 1965. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions. To find out more about this program and the many other video and audio programs we produce, please visit our website at www.pdxjustice.org. You'll find programs featuring a range of outstanding speakers including David Cole, Susan Faludi, Diana Butu, Noam Chomsky, Phyllis Bennis, Jonathan Kozal, Dar Jamail, Paul Krugman, P. Sinath, and many others. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access cable television, net neutrality, and all forms of grassroots, democratic, community media.